Moin, ich bin Eva Schibilla. Ich bin heute eure Moderatorin slash Host für diesen Abend. Queer Traces in Space and Time. Ich freue mich voll selber. Und ich will ja grüßen. Also ich persönlich bin übrigens in der Spedition, ähm, was man hier nicht so gut sieht. Aber ähm, also ihr seht diesmal nur eine Wand der Spedition. Und normalerweise gibt es hier mehr zu sehen. Ähm, ich möchte erstmal alle begrüßen, die mit mir hier sind, die ihr nicht seht, und zwar alle TeilnehmerInnen des Workshops. Zwölf an der Zahl, fast alle sind heute hier. Dann möchte ich begrüßen natürlich alle VeranstalterInnen, die sind auch mit mir in der Spedition, die Technik und alle, die jetzt gerade per Livestream zuschauen. Schön, dass ihr dabei seid. Ich freue mich. Und ganz kurz nochmal in Englisch. Das ist eine wichtige Information von Anfang an. Und zwar ähm, werde ich jetzt die meiste Zeit Deutsch sprechen. So, in this event I will mostly speak German. And, but if you feel more comfortable with uh, an English translation, we have a wonderful um, translator, <laughs> sorry, interpreter. Uh, her name is Rima Radhakrishnan. And she is here with us. So in any case, if you need help, please let us know. And through our text chat, for example, through Telegram or, or even uh, on YouTube. So please let us know if you feel more comfortable with an English translation, then we will try to make that happen. So, um, aber für den Rest des <laughs> für die um, nächsten Minuten werde ich erstmal Deutsch sprechen. Und äh, zunächst sage ich erstmal was zu Queer Traces in Space and Time. Der Workshop oder eher gesagt die Auftaktveranstaltung für den Workshop, für den wir heute hier sind. Es ist eine dreitägige Veranstaltung, heute mit Gästen. Ein Gast ist äh, Jack Giesking aus den USA und ein Gast ist heute auch live dabei, Philipp Guffler aus Amsterdam bzw. München. Und genau, die werdet ihr später noch treffen. Dieser Workshop findet statt im Rahmen der City Data Explosion. In Bremen und Hamburg findet diese Veranstaltungsreihe statt seit 2013. Diese Veranstaltungsreihe setzt sich mit den Wechselwirkungen von Medien und Räumen auseinander. Und in diesem dreitägigen Workshop, der bereits auch letztes Jahr stattgefunden hat, zum ersten Mal, geht es speziell um queere Orte, wie ja, wahrscheinlich alle wissen, sind queere Orte ja nicht unbedingt von Dauer, sondern sie sind häufig temporär, sie sind fragil. Und genau da stellt sich halt die Frage, wie kann man diese Orte erinnern und vor allem, wie kann man sie auch kartografieren? Äh, ein Wort, das sich nicht allzu oft benutze, wie man merkt. Äh, auf jeden Fall ist da die Frage, diese Frage eben, wie kann man queere Orte kartografieren, die hat sich der Workshop im letzten Jahr gestellt, Herausgekommen ist eine wahnsinnig beeindruckende dreidimensionale Karte, zu der ich erstmal noch nicht so viel sagen möchte, weil das machen unter anderem auch noch die VeranstalterInnen. Die stelle ich euch jetzt mal vor. Also zuallererst wird dieses Event, diese Veranstaltung unterstützt heute von der Rosa-Luxemburg-Stiftung in Bremen. Jetzt funktioniert der Ton anscheinend auch nebenan. <lacht> ähm, genau. Ein bisschen warten nehme ich an. Kann es sein, dass es leckt? Ist gut? Okay. Also, einer der Veranstalter heute ist Thomas Böker, Vorsitzender des Kunst- und Kulturvereins, der selbst auch viele Veranstaltungen hier in Bremen, auch queere Veranstaltungen mit veranstaltet hat. Wir haben Nina Helker noch dabei aus Hamburg. Sie arbeitet an der Schnittstelle von Stadtforschung und Digitalisierung quasi auch eine Datenexpertin. Wir haben auch noch Ulf Träger, ein Gestalter aus Hamburg. Der ist auch mit mir jetzt hier dabei. Ulf, bist du da? Mal gucken, ob ich dich auch sehe. Hey, kannst du Sehr mich schön. hören? Super. Ja. Hi hey Eva. Hallo. So, ich muss tatsächlich, genau, ich habe nicht immer die Kamera mit im Blick. Ich hoffe, es funktioniert alles. Wenn nicht, lasst es mich wissen. Ist auch für mich eine Premiere, muss ich sagen. Ich bin übrigens Journalistin und äh, ein digitales Event, das habe ich noch nicht so oft gemacht. Ja, Ulf, wie kommt es dazu, dass der Workshop 
jetzt in diesem Jahr noch einmal stattfindet, ein zweites Mal. Ja, Eva, ähm, die Vorgeschichte hast du ja schon kurz angedeutet. Der Rahmen ist ja City Data Explosion, wo Thomas und ich seit Jahren Veranstaltungen machen, wo wir uns immer wieder mit so Digitalisierung und öffentlichen Raum, urbanen Raum beschäftigen. Und auch aus der eigenen Biografie heraus ähm, und auch der Frage, wie sozusagen so eine emanzipatorische Praxis aussehen kann, war es eigentlich auch ähm, zwangsläufig, dass wir auch ähm, uns dem, der Frage ähm, stellen, wie queere Orte, queere Situationen, queere Interventionen auch im öffentlichen Raum, wie die zum Beispiel sichtbar gemacht werden können. Weil gerade Sichtbarkeit ja von sowas Fragilen, wie du es gesagt hast, ja auch ganz entscheidend ist. Und letztes Jahr haben wir ein paar Leute eingeladen, so einen ersten Workshop zu machen. Der war sehr intensiv, sehr toll, ähm, sehr reichhaltig. Und ähm, das schönste Outcome, das schönste Ergebnis dieses Workshops war, dass sich praktisch alle Teilnehmenden da entschieden haben, in einer Arbeitsgruppe weiter an diesem Thema zu arbeiten. Und ähm, dann auch angefangen haben, weitere Veranstaltungen zu planen, aber vor allem dann auch ähm, in so einem taktischen äh, Aspekt ähm, sich auf eine Plattform, auf ein Mapping-Konzept geeinigt hat, um sich zum Beispiel stattdessen mehr um so inhaltliche und äh, Fragen der Narration, der Geschichten, die man erzählen will, die Situation, auf die man hinweisen will, zu konzentrieren. Wir hatten dann auch schon im Herbst wieder Veranstaltungen geplant und dann muss man dazu sagen, gab es leider einen sehr, sehr traurigen Moment, als dann im September mitten in den Vorbereitungen für die nächste Veranstaltung einer von uns gestorben ist. Ähm, ja, Schönes, um seinen Namen nochmal deutlich auch zu erwähnen, war ein guter Freund von einigen von uns, ein sehr toller ähm, Zeitgenosse, ein ähm, ähm, Akademiker, der zum Thema queere Rezeptionen im, ähm, äh, in den Bildenden Künsten geschrieben hat, der aber auch Aktivist war. Als Transmann hat er sich in den letzten Jahren sehr stark engagiert, bundesweit für die Rechte von Transmenschen. Und da war sein plötzlicher Tod ein Riesenschock für uns und natürlich auch ein Verlust von all diesen Ebenen, die ich gerade genannt habe. Und dann haben wir erstmal unsere Aktivitäten eingestellt und dann nach ein paar Monaten gesagt, okay, das war mit Josch so geplant, wir machen das jetzt weiter auch in seinem Geiste. Und daraus kam dann dieser Plan, jetzt nochmal so einen Workshop zu machen, diese Veranstaltung heute zu machen mit zwei, wie ich denke, wundervollen, spannenden Gästen, die sich vielleicht uns auch eine Inspiration geben. Und wir sind jetzt eine Handvoll, zwei Handvoll Leute aus unterschiedlichen Kontexten. Und ich bin sehr gespannt, wie wir sozusagen das, was wir schon so ein bisschen angefangen haben zu denken, jetzt vielleicht nochmal hinterfragen, nochmal diskutieren, aber auch vielleicht vorantreiben und ähm, auch ähm, Karten produzieren. Sehr schön. Das ist also auch der Schwerpunkt dieses Mal wieder, Karten zu produzieren. Mhm. Ja. Super, dann... Ähm würde ich direkt mal äh, zu unseren KünstlerInnen weitergehen. Ähm, für die KünstlerInnen-Gespräche sind wir ja heute unter anderem, also ihr wäre wahrscheinlich da draußen auch alle hier. Ähm, und zwar möchte ich noch einen kleinen Hinweis an dieser Stelle für alle, die zuschauen, geben. Am Ende, also nach den KünstlerInnen-Gesprächen, wird es noch eine Diskussion geben mit Philipp und mit Jack, diese Diskussion wird auf Englisch geführt werden ähm, und zu dieser Diskussion freuen wir uns natürlich sehr, wenn ihr uns eure Fragen schickt. Eure Fragen gern, wenn ihr wollt, auf Englisch, äh, aber auch auf Deutsch. Also wir würden die gerne auch übersetzen, also wie euch das lieber ist, womit ihr euch wohlfühlt. Eure Fragen könnt ihr ganz einfach an uns schicken und zwar entweder via Twitter. Ihr müsst uns einfach nur erwähnen, also mention at citydata. Oder im Pad, zu dem ihr hoffentlich alle Zugang habt, über Telegram. Oder sonst könnt ihr auch auf YouTube direkt unter diesem Stream könnt ihr kommentieren. Wir haben da ein Team, das wird sich eure Fragen sofort schnappen. Und genau, steht euch für Fragen auch zur Verfügung. Sehr schön, dann würde ich mal anfangen mit unserem ersten Gast. Und zwar ist das Jack Diesking, wie ich vorhin schon erwähnte. Eine kleine Einführung dazu, also Jack Giesking ist Geograf, queer-feministischer Theoretiker und Professor an der University of Kentucky. Ähm, wer sich Jacks Arbeit anschaut, der sieht ganz viele Karten, Netzwerke, ähm, das sind Visualisierungen queerer Geschichte, wie er schreibt, ähm, 
Es sind aber auch tatsächlich Fakten, die mir da in Erinnerung geblieben sind. Also zum Beispiel stellt er da in Grafiken, wie hoch ist das Durchschnittseinkommen lesbischer Paare in New York oder wie zeichnen quasi queere New YorkerInnen ihre Orte und Subkulturen in der Stadt auf. Also die Orte, an denen sie sich bewegen. Und diese Karten sammelt Jack auf seiner Seite unter anderem, die übrigens sehr empfehlenswert ist. Und mehr zu seiner Arbeit erzählt euch Jack selbst in diesem Video, der uns geschickt hat vorab. So, hello there. I am Jack Giesking. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm honored that you invited me. Uh, I am recording this from the unceded lands of the Duwamish people, what is now most often known as Seattle, Washington in the United States. Um, there have been many protests here. I don't usually live here, I was here for the summer. Um, and uh, it's been a good place to uh, connect with the land and think about uh, what I wanna share with you um, today and um, to, to think also about revolution and liberation um, and how that has to work differently and build off of what we know, which is a lot of what my work is about. So uh, if I look over, I'm looking at my notes. Uh, I am a uh, queer geographer. It's probably the shortest summary of who I am. Uh, I also do uh, feminist and trans geographies. Now my focus is on the urban and digital sphere. So originally I'm getting much more into rural environments and even some suburban, not my favorite, uh, as I grew up in one, not, nothing against people who live in the suburbs now, uh, just a personal preference and that's okay. Uh, I pretty much go wherever queers go um, in the broadest sense of the word, I want to study how they make space, how they find one another, how they sustain connection, how they reinvent worlds, um, uh, especially how they make worlds of their own when the world doesn't want them. Uh, and so what I study specifically, that's like a general thing, but uh, my book is called A Queer New York that comes out. Uh, evidently it's in print. I found out yesterday amazing. I'm so excited. Um, and I'll get to touch it, I guess, next week. Ooh. Uh, and the book is called A Queer New York, Geographies of Lesbian Stikes and Queers. And it is the first lesbian and or queer history specifically of New York City. Um, there are literally less than 10 queer histories or sociological, anthropological, geographical queer histories of New York City. Um, and that's pretty profound because we think that a lot of queerness is about New York. Um, and people either really love New York or they hate New York and they hate how it's all about New York. And that both of those things are absolutely fair. Uh, I feel the same. And I lived in New York for over a decade. And uh, what my book was trying to do, and I hope it does, uh, is to show how there are really so many versions of a queer New York. Uh, and um, why did I write about this? Well, the, the fact that there wasn't a lesbian or queer history of New York was painful to me because I wanted to read it. So I wrote the book I wanted to read and also wrote the book that I wanted to learn from. All the things that I learned while writing the book, I wanted them to be in there. Um, I wanted as many things as possible to, um, as many kinds of stories and kinds of people uh, represented so that people would see themselves there if they wanted to and connect with people there. Um, the idea for the book came about in 2007. I was doing my oral exams for my PhD and I was reading a lot of work on gender, sexuality, and space. Look. Can you hear me? And I was reading everything I possibly could, hundreds and hundreds of articles. And one thing I noticed, sorry, that's the Seattle airport is very close by, if you're hearing that, the planes are landing. Um, so one thing I noticed in this gender, sexuality, and space literature 
is that there was an assumption that lesbian, gay, bi, trans, queer, two-spirit, intersex, asexual, any, any LGBTQ plus spectrum that we really, and I, I should tell you identify as a butch, uh, trans, dyke, queer person, masculine, way masculine in the center. And um, when I was reading all this literature, what stuck out to me is there was this assumption that gay people, gay people at the time, 2007, just getting into writing about queer and, right. Um, but this idea of LGBTQ people uh, really liking neighborhoods. We love a neighborhood. Bars, just can't get enough of them. And cities as if we couldn't live anywhere else. And I say this with sarcasm because it was really weird to me because I knew lots of queer people, LGBTQ people, and all different persuasions who didn't like any of those things and didn't relate to any of those things. I also read a huge amount of literature about women's spaces. And there was very little literature on trans geographies at the time. I mean, mostly just about bathrooms. So when I read about women's spaces, it seemed that women were really afraid of public space in cities. Now, how do those things match up? They don't. Hey, Jake. Um, it's, we just heard. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Once more. Hi, Jack. It's really so nice to meet you, not only in the video, but uh, kind of, yeah, like in another video, like in different realities, and perhaps it's still the same reality. I'm not really sure. Um, <laughs> I wrote already to you in the chat right now. For me, it feels like as if it is something like, like a, like kind of a loop. I'm, I'm really not sure. Um, yes, yes. So um, wonderful that you're here. Thanks. Um, in the video, you spoke about your motivation for focusing on queer geographies and um, following your interest to making visible that women are not afraid or not always afraid about public space in general, or in other words, that women and lesbian queers are using public spaces a lot and have since long been visible in multiple places. We now really like to speak with you about your map about a queer geography of New York. That is a common yeah, idea. Yeah. And uh, perhaps as the first or as the yeah, first question, the data that you used for the book and for the map comes from interviews, but not only from the interviews you conducted, but also, as I understood it, from a kind of a deep dive into the lesbian history archive. And maybe you can start to tell us what the archive research exactly was about and what the interview was. Sure. Um, so first of all, thank you for having me. I'm honored and excited that you would um, want to talk to me about this. Like I, I care so much about queer liberation as well, and I'm hoping maps can just create alternate histories of what we think about. So I'm going to try and um, uh, I, the, the Lesbian History Archives um, is the largest lesbian archive in the world and located in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, um, the second and the second being Spinboden. Um, in Berlin. So, um, and I worked extensively in both. And my original interest in going to the archive was, I, I love archives, I'm biased, but also that um, uh, I got a lot of pushback that I would interview lesbians and queers, um, uh, women and trans and gender nonconforming people over 25 years and not situated in what happened in that moment that might not hold. And so I, Uh, they have over 30 collections at the archives. They have, they have sex toys sitting around. They have uh, like a button collection, a t-shirt collection. But there's only these two archives that have dates and times on them. One is the organizational records and the other is the periodicals. Springboden has a huge, like massive, stunning periodical collection, but has very few organizational records. Um, and so I wasn't able to make that comparison, but uh, it was a way for me to make A, a massive spreadsheet of 391 organizations and every address that was ever mentioned that they ever met at or had a, an activist intervention. No one's ever mapped ACT UP before, which is just mind-blowing, um, or Lesbian Avengers or Queer Nation. Um, and I started to realize that 
that there's these very like repeat repetitive ideas of that we don't have any history or we didn't do that much or everything goes back especially with new york it's all about stonewall um or and then act up and so i really wanted to complicate that history uh and share what i found i had no intention at first of you know i, I thought i'd make a map but as soon as you make a map it has so much power it gives people so much energy to see our really our different histories and then at the same time it's very finalized and fixed um, and maps have so much authority so it's something i was quite torn about um said that you have no you had no intention when you started doing the research but um when when i look at the result or part of the results i am wondering if you in the beginning already were thinking about um, mapping or um, finding out more about an ev this everyday queer New York, because what I really have um, still in my mind and what, what I was find really interesting is that you don't only map mm, the kind of typical things, like not only mm, lesbian places, but also, as you mentioned in one of your interviews, um, that there was, for example, the address from from a hairdresser, a hairdresser yeah. somewhere in New York who had an ad in one of the periodicals. Yeah. And I was wondering if that also was part of the um, starting point of your research. Yeah, I was I was just really tired of reading about bars. I enjoy them, but I don't enjoy them that much. And I don't think everyone enjoys them. I mean, there were, you know, I think 40, 50 bars on a map for gay men in, in just half the lower half of Manhattan. And there were three for women in the early 2000s. And so just telling the history of bars is not telling every, it's not telling at least the lesbian, trans, queer, um, gender normative, gender non-normative perspective. And I was also, um, I felt like I read a lot about what I call protests and potlucks and um, that they're like these tropes about lesbian queer life. And I think they're awesome. and at times funny and at times sad and important, and, but they also share our culture. And I wanted to know what our lives were like. What was it like? Like, what was it like to be, to live under AIDS and try to make sense of your life? Like what caused so many people to rise up and fight for their lives, right? That they were fighting for their lives. And then why did it go away? Um, and why did, you know, what happened to all this amazing activism that became these official nonprofits and, and how do people feel about that? And, 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 what did you know that was like that just like walking through the street like how did you get your hair cut where did you buy your groceries where did you feel safe buying clothes you know um and trying to put together like a whole queer life rather than just yeah repeating the same stories yeah so when i picked these, oh sorry you go yeah st still the same topic when you are um you have i think one thousand and hundred places yeah. that you map on this um map um and talking about the difference between hairdresser or the percentage perhaps about bars versus hairdressers versus more private places is there to get a broader idea of what you what you really made visible with this map distinguishes your map from other maps because i think your your um, focus on queer geographies is a much broader or your concept of, of queer geographies is a much broader than it is in, in several other mapping projects. What is that sort of range between yeah. and hairdressers? Well, there's like a lot, there's a lot of amazing maps. Like um, Jeff, um, I think his name's for Caro. I, I don't know how to say his last name is an amazing map of the whole history of nightlife in New York city hundreds and hundreds of places from the 1800s starting in the 1800s and then the new york city lgbt historic sites is talking about what we can register with historic preservation and i really want to think about the things that get forgotten you know where you know what what like what was it like to walk down the street because you know how do we really understand one another? how do we make we made so much change we fought for so many things and what brought us together and how do we recognize one another and what fell apart over time in one of my interviews a participant who came out in 1984 was talking with women who came out in the 90s and the 2000s and uh, the woman who came out in 84 said well, when i was evicted and the women who came out in the 90s and 2000s said why were you evicted she said because i was gay and they were like oh my god i'm so embarrassed i'm so sorry and i was like we're writing this history now. Like, don't feel bad. 
Um, like no one knows what this woman's life was like, you know, what, why did they move certain, pl- like, there's so many factors that are so like rich and complicated. And I, I wanted, I wanted lesbian and queer people to kind of like upset the generational rift to like think across much more think across racial divides and class divides. Um, and to, to, you know, at times we fought together, how can we use a, you know, a queer approach, um, to, to come together to fight, you know, like, uh, and not just anti-heterosexual, that's not it at all, not at all, but like, really those non-normative people, what are our lives like, and how do we get by, like, how do we not just survive, but thrive, and like, what does it take to thrive in the world, um, yeah, so I want to tell those stories, yeah. That kind of leads to the, to one of the next questions, because um, I was wondering, um, talking listening to you talking about the woman who, who, who was evicted um, as well as um, other parts of um, your writings where you, where you yeah. uh, mentioned that you did interviews where women mentioned that they walked with a walkman around along a street and they heard a certain song and uh, you're not only working on this map which um, precisely um, shows the places of women, lesbians, and queers, but you also intend to um, produce or to create layers where stories become visible. Um, yeah. So for me, it's kind of um, connecting the dots to, to uh, develop stories or not to develop, but to, to make stories visible and histories visible. Um, how can that work or how how can can I imagine how how you deal with it because a song doesn't fit, fit to a certain street and a walkman or right. items that occurred in your interviews do not either. Yeah. Yeah. I mean like so much of, of queerness is, is ineffable or, or, or like not physical or substantial, but we exist in like, there are the Sleater Kenny people and the Indigo Girls people and the, and the, you know, and the Farron people and like they have a way of recognizing existing and that story about them walking around in the 80s listening to her walkman and listening to like true lesbian acoustic folk music from the early 80s and crying and saying i'm not going to kill myself because somebody else is out there listening to this music like the, the best i can do is like well what wrote what route did she walk down and why did she go that way like she um uh that person um, Chris lived in uh, in Greenwich Village. She was the only one who could afford to live in Greenwich Village. She got a rent stabilized apartment, and she talked about um, just like her everyday life and those paths. I had a lot of my participants tell me that there was a cat caller down the street from the LGBT center, and so they always walked on the other side of the street. And so for 25 years, this cat had forced women and trans people cross the street so they could be safe. That we're following the same path. For decades is mind blowing, so it's about listening to people's stories and about holding them all together. Because when they're all apart, it just seems like, oh yeah, I go through that. But we don't realize that we're we're enacting the same sort of geographies or or suffering or um, fighting in the same ways. And in, in the book, I start to write about um, that there are all these kind of dots on a map, and there's also lines and paths. And that's something I want to do in the next map is to take each women and queer per- and transgender non-conforming person story and make their constellation. So all the dots that they went to that come and go like stars in the sky and the paths they take between them. And you can click on Wanda and see Wanda's life and hear like audio stories. Um, it takes a lot more tech to do that and a lot of effort. So I was able to launch these maps for now. Um, but to think about like, yeah, I think there's like, there have to be other ways of rendering. Like, can I take you under a 3D street you feel it and I could play you the music that would be amazing you know that's that's the dream in the long run um, but right now it comes up as a bunch of dots but it's like oh we were there you know I made these maps for all my I made the maps like I thought I don't know would anyone like this and I showed it to one of my participants when I made the first map and she started crying and she's like I said I she said I didn't know we had this much history and I was like oh I have to do this I have to keep going um, just to have evidence of us. And that means so much to people, just that we exist. Um, yeah. You mentioned the word or the concept of constellations just right now. Yeah. And um, as I understood it, it is, it is to grasp aspects like rising and fading of places, as well as taking into account that people and places are moving or are, are vanishing. Um, yeah. Can you explain a bit 
more about or can you please explain what the concept of, of constellations may help to understand the production of queer spaces? Because sure. it's going to so, be very new. It, it's Yeah, it's new. So a lot of different marginalized groups use constellations, especially um, in, in, in many different indigenous tribes and First Nations um, uh, talk about constellations like a, the Anishabi. Um, and uh, I think like our use of constellations, part of it was astrological, love a queer astrology, and, um, but also that the spaces aren't fixed. And so a lot of the ways that people write about um, space or time and geography or in queer theory or trans or feminist theory is really thinking about territory and responding to territorial models like a neighborhood. Um, and it doesn't work that way for lesbians and queers. They can't buy a lot of real estate. They can't accumulate wealth. They make so much less money. Um, people of color visit mostly and do not stay. Um, there's policing um, and uh, there's uh, bigotry and racism and violence. So how um, thinking about where lesbians and queers lived and how they got to the village and to the East Village and to Park Slope or other places and they commuted two hours or two hours from Brooklyn. That story is just important. Trash day. That story is just as important as uh, what's happening in these in the bar. Always about the bar because it's a long term place. Um, but trying to map uh, these places that come and go is also when I listen to the stories of my participants, um, the places that weren't there matter just as much as what was there because they don't have a lot, so they carry it with them wherever they go, and it forms who they are, um, and they walk by the places where the bar used to be, like where the Duchess Bar used to be is now a Starbucks, and it was the 80s bar in New York City, and they all mentioned it, and they're like, I still walk by, and I think of the Duchess, you know, woman, woman after trans, after queer person saying this, and so I think um, thinking about lesbian queer spaces have always been called networks, and thinking about how that relates to physical places and not just we're social beings, but how we move from spaces that aren't as, as anted down or fixed is really important. So constellations is a way to think about it differently and, and to see and to realize, wow, we have this amazing connectivity and we also have this attachment to physical space and how do we want to move forward towards, towards liberation and, and to work for justice together with the ways that we're already working that are really good. Before we hand over to Eva again, um, I have one last question. Uh, one last question, and uh, that's about the the aspect of certainty or uncertainty. Because when you when you were sitting in the archives and um, or afterwards sorting out, out what can be on the shown on the map and what not, um, for us as the group who is uh, also working on a queer map, we are really often facing the situation that either a flyer doesn't has to uh, men doesn't mention the city or doesn't mention um, a year. So as if every, yeah, as if there's no time. And yes. how did you deal with these uncertainties or in um, not fixed informations? Um, I cried a lot and I was very sad. But I remember a flyer that I was really excited about, and it said, come to the rally on Friday. And I was like, about what? What Friday? Where is it? What is Sisters, brothers, themsters, what's our history? And kind of having a meltdown and finding out from a lot of activist friends that that's an activist archive, that, it, that space and time are impermanent. But it, was, but it was also like in reading these things that didn't have space and time and then listening to my interviews, that I was able to stitch together what happened where in lots of places that was vague to me in an interview and I wouldn't have pursued it. But then I remember the council member had done that thing and it's, it was such a bigot and had said that and, oh, that relates, you know. So it was putting together these people's stories that I interviewed with the archives. Um, but that took, you know, years of thinking and going back and forth between them. Um, but so many stories are locked off the map because nobody put down where they are. And so then we're like, why are we making all these maps when we can't, maps aren't who we are, right? So I'm, t I'm t yeah, but maps mean something to people. Uh, yeah. I think one other thing, oh, what did you say? Oh, just one other thing is that 
I came up with constellations because a lot of my participants thought they were failures and they really were hard on themselves that they hadn't done enough and they had done such beautiful things and that they were alive was amazing. And I wanted them to feel better about themselves because I, it was, it was so sad to listen to them say such hard things about everything. And yeah. So I wanted them to be like, Oh yeah, we, we are alive and we're kicking it. So yeah, I want them to, you know, have energy, do something new, um, and feel connected, and that they need each other because they do. When you have Oops. Okay. Na dann. Good. Kann ich weiter? Okay, wir hatten gerade eine kleine Unterbrechung, wie ihr wahrscheinlich gemerkt habt. Nur noch mal ein kleiner Hinweis. Also für alle, die jetzt quasi vielleicht ein bisschen später eingeschaltet haben, sage ich mal. Ähm, wir werden später noch diskutieren mit Jack und Philipp, unseren beiden Gästen. Und wir sind sehr neugierig auf eure Fragen an Jack und Philipp. Das heißt, bitte schickt uns eure Fragen jetzt im Laufe des weiteren Talks. Und zwar schickt ihr die am besten, das seht ihr, jetzt habe ich meinen Zettel verlegt, äh, auf Twitter zum Beispiel könnt ihr uns einfach einmal erwähnen, also Menschen at City Data. Oder auf YouTube könnt ihr uns ein paar Kommentare hinterlassen oder über die Telegram-Gruppe könnt ihr auf unser Pad zugreifen und auch dort könnt ihr eure Fragen lassen. Das wäre auf jeden Fall schön. Um, in case you need someone who translates the next talk for you because it will be in German. Um, please contact us. We have Remy here who will translate or try to translate everything for you. So please let us know. Okay, sehr schön. Dann mache ich weiter mit unserem nächsten Gast, Philipp Guffler. Er ist Künstler, lebt die meiste Zeit in Amsterdam mittlerweile, wenn ich das richtig verstanden habe, aber auch in München. In München ist er auch Mitglied des Forums Queeres Archiv München. Er arbeitet zu queeren Praxen und viele seiner Werke wurden bereits in Berlin, München und auch Amsterdam ausgestellt. Und viel mehr brauche ich erstmal noch gar nicht dazu sagen, weil wir haben einen hervorragenden Clip von Philipp bekommen indem er uns ein bisschen in seine Arbeit einführt. Also viel Spaß und bis gleich. Robert Gallo sagte, Promiskuität ist der Mutter der Seuche. Und jetzt den Leuten, und jetzt den Leuten zu sagen, macht nur so weiter euer hamsterhaftes Und alle Mitarbeiter des Kreisverwaltungsreferats. Ein kleines Kondom zu benutzen, das ist mit Sicherheit. Peter Gauweiler. Ich hätte gerne auch den Damen und Herren diskutiert, die so vehement gegen mich protestiert haben, ohne mich überhaupt anzuhören. Denn das ist das Besondere an der Aids-Problem. Aids ist insofern keine Frage der Politik, sondern der Biologie. Und jetzt den Leuten, und jetzt den Leuten zu sagen, macht nur so weiter euer hamsterhaftes Sexualleben. Alles weiter so, nur zwischendrin äh, ein, klein, äh, ein kleines Kondom zu benutzen, das ist mit Sicherheit der falsche Weg. Ich hätte gerne auch mit den Damen und Herren diskutiert, die so vehement gegen mich protestiert haben, ohne mich überhaupt anzuhören. Denn das ist das Besondere an der Rechtsproblematik.
und noch ein Zeichentrickfilm, der demnächst in ganz Norwegen gezeigt wird. Im sexuellen Kontakt liegt das größte Risiko dieser Krankheit. Sei daher kritisch bei der Auswahl deiner Partner und hab keinen Verkehr mit irgendjemand. Die Ansteckungsgefahr wird geringer, wenn du ein Kondom benutzt. Sei kritisch und wählerisch und habe nicht zu viele Sexualpartner. Mit großer Offenheit werden derzeit in Broschüren, Tageszeitungen und im Fernsehen auch die Risiken verschiedener Sexualpraktiken dargestellt. Okay. Ihr sagt wieder los. It's sort of appropriate that this is my last major public address here to talk, because I do believe that the future lies with us, in a very deep way. Die Erscheinungen zum Leben erwecken. Aber ich denke doch, ich denke doch, Doppelpunkt, die Erscheinungen zum Leben erwecken. So, hallo. Ähm, ich freue mich sehr, dass äh, Philipp jetzt bei uns ist. Danke nochmal an Jack für seinen Input. Diesen Teil des Gesprächs werden wir jetzt auf Deutsch führen. Uh, we will have this talk in uh, German and I hope uh, all English speaking and understanding people don't leave us now because uh, the discussion afterwards we will have together in English together with Jack and Philip and uh, and us all here at uh, Spedition. So. Hello. Um, Ganz vielen Dank jetzt mal für die ähm, Einladung und äh, hier zu sprechen. Ich freue mich total. Ich war zweimal in meinem Leben in Bremen, um den Künstler, der gleich vorletztes Jahr verstorben ist, Ferdinand Kriewert, das war ein schwuler Künstler, der in Bremen gestorben ist, zu besuchen. Und ja, schade, dass ich natürlich nicht bei euch vor Ort sein kann. Und äh, ich glaube, wir alle hoffen sehr, dass bald wieder Situationen möglich sind, wo wir äh, direkt miteinander zusammenkommen können. Auf der anderen Seite sind wir froh, weil ich glaube, Jack hätten wir nicht so einfach nach Bremen <lacht> So beging, äh, gibt es durch äh, Corona-bedingte äh, Veranstaltungsformate halt und wir dann auch wiederum Chancen, miteinander ins Gespräch zu kommen. Okay, ich würde gerne... Äh, mit der ersten Frage anfangen. Deine künstlerische Arbeit äh, bewegt sich im Spannungsfeld von Geschichte, queerer Geschichte, einzelnen Geschichten, queeren Geschichten. Ähm, und du nutzt Referenzen, äh, konkrete Archivarbeit, von Footage ähm, und äh, setzt sie in Beziehung zueinander. Und äh, eine Frage, mit der wir uns auch in den nächsten Tagen im äh, Workshop beschäftigen werden, ist, äh, was, was wollen wir eigentlich über uns erzählen, über unsere Kämpfe, über unsere 
Träume, äh, über unsere Momente, die wir manchmal nur miteinander haben und äh, wie können wir diese Geschichten erzählen und in Bezug setzen und ähm, dann nochmal gelingt zu deiner künstlerischen Arbeit, wie beeinflussen diese Fragen deine künstlerische Praxis? Ich bin auch schon über sieben Jahre Mitglied im Forum Queeres Archiv München. Das ist ein kleines, selbstorganisiertes Archiv, das 1999 gegründet worden ist, in München eben. Und dort habe ich seit 2008 an der Kunstakademie studiert und äh, freie Kunst und habe ähm, Arbeiten immer mehr gemacht, die sich auch mit queerer Geschichte auseinandergesetzt haben. Also vor allem ähm, Act Up oder Group Material oder Channel Idea, Derek Charman, ähm, waren Künstlerinnen und Künstler, Kollektive, mit denen ich mich stark auseinandergesetzt habe, ähm, die alle eine sehr amerikanische oder britische Perspektive gehabt haben, weswegen ich eigentlich sehr genau wusste, äh, wie die Situation in den in Anfängen der Aids-Krise in den United States war, also auch durch die kulturelle oder künstliche Produktion der Künstler und des künstlerischen Aktivismus, der ähm, in den 80er Jahren stattgefunden hat aber wusste sehr wenig über die Situation in Deutschland. Und irgendwann mal war ich in einer Ausstellung, ähm, wo Objekte aus dem Forum ähm, ausgestellt wurden und bin mir dann eigentlich erst dadurch auch bewusst geworden, wie wenig ich gewusst habe oder über die spezifische Situation in München außerhalb dieses ähm, Leine wenn der Fassbinder, Freddie Mercury Motiv äh, oder der Geschichte, aus den späten 70er Jahren, aber die fand ich immer, dass die sehr, oder frühen 80er Jahren, dass die sehr distanziert der Stadt München, wie sie heute für mich war, wo es eigentlich immer mehr ähm, alternative Orte verschwunden sind und eigentlich, ja, ähm, es eine gewisse Frustration gegeben hat von Fehlen von diesen Freiflächen, auch, in, in, auch für Künstlerinnen, aber auch für mich einfach als als Mensch und deswegen halt dann, ähm, bin ich in das selbstorganisierte Archiv gekommen und wollte es jetzt mal eben nur über die Aids-Krise oder die Anfänge der Aids-Krise in Deutschland recherchieren, aber habe dort ähm, so viele andere Sachen gefunden, dass ich eigentlich seitdem ähm, nie wieder aufgehört habe. Und es gibt so eine äh, Fernsehdokumentation vom Bayerischen Rundfunk aus den frühen 2000er Jahren über die Anfänge der Aids-Krise, aber ich hatte auch so eine Frustration, ähm, wie sonst so Fernsehdokumentationen ähm, erzählt werden. Das, so ist dann eben die, den Ausschnitt, den ihr gerade gesehen habt, das war eben aus einer Arbeit, Projektion auf die Krise Gaumalereien in München. Das ist die erste Arbeit, die ich dort im Forum gemacht habe. Ein Video und ein dazugehöriges Künstlerbuch, das eben genau diese Geschichte versucht, anders zu erzählen. Also eben auch viel mehr persönlicher, also später, als in dem kompletten Video, wo ihr jetzt nur einen Ausschnitt gesehen habt, spreche ich dann noch mit Guido Wehl, der die Münchner Aids-Hilfe gegründet hat und mit einem behandelten Arzt. Also es sind auch sehr persönliche Geschichten, die aber, die ich eben versucht habe, nicht auf einer reißerischen oder einer skandalisierenden Weise zu erzählen, aber trotzdem die Verwerfungen von den Politikern ähm, genauso zu benennen. Und gerade, wo ich dann fertig geworden bin mit der Arbeit äh, 2014, ist dann kurz danach Gauweiler auch wieder als CSU-Vize gewählt worden. Und in allen seinen Nachrufen wurde seine frühere Aids-Politik komplett verschwiegen. Der, er verklagt auch regelmäßig Journalisten, die versuchen, darüber zu schreiben. Sobald die, der ist ja auch nebenberuflich immer noch als Anwalt tätig. Sobald die ein falsches Wort darüber schreiben, ähm, wird er, verklagt er sie. Und deswegen ähm, gibt es so, ja, so wenig Wissen natürlich außerhalb einer klassischen LGBT-IQ-Älteren-Szene ähm, über die Situation in den 80ern. Und ich bin natürlich eine andere Generation. Und nur die Archivmaterialien zwischen den verschiedenen Mitgliedern. Zu dem Zeitpunkt war ich dann das jüngste Mitglied im Forum und den Austausch mit einer ganz einer anderen Generation von mir. Also unser ältestes Mitglied ähm, ist letztes Jahr mit 100 Jahren gestorben. Der, ähm, 
kannte noch aus eigener Hand die Nazi verfolgen unter dem Paragraphen 175 und genau diesen ähm, generationenübergreifenden Austausch, der war eigentlich so, so ein total und einfach die Gespräche, die persönlichen Gespräche eigentlich so total wichtig. Ähm, ich zum Beispiel kann mich äh, noch gut daran erinnern, äh, Ende der 80er, Anfang der 90er, äh, Gauweiler äh, in den äh, Schlagzeilen mit äh, tatsächlich hat irgendwie Lagern, die er gefordert hat für äh, HIV-Positive. Und äh, ich würde dir komplett zustimmen, dass äh, da heute eigentlich äh, überhaupt gar nicht mehr darüber geredet wird. Äh, und dass, dass, äh, tatsächlich hat irgendwie eine Art äh, Sprechverbot darüber halt irgendwie, irgendwie, irgendwie gibt. So. Aber für die, viele Leute hatte natürlich seine Aids-Politik sehr starke Auswirkungen. Also es wurden zum Beispiel ähm, Leute, die HIV ähm, positiv getestet worden sind und die Tests sollten veröffentlicht werden, die sollten nicht mehr verbeamtet werden und so weiter und so fort. Also für ganz viele Leute hatte es kon konkrete Konsequenzen, jedoch nicht für die verantwortlichen Politiker von damals. Das ist natürlich die, die Frustration davon, dass es eigentlich denen fast gelungen ist, ähm, ja, das aus der Geschichtsschreibung sozusagen rauszuerzählen und das hat mich dann natürlich zu Fragen gestellt, wie überhaupt so ein Prozess von der Geschichtsschreibung stattfindet. Also was fällt aus einer Geschichtsschreibung auch heraus? Oder wie kann auch eine Geschichtsschreibung einfach anders stattfinden? Und äh, in einem Interview, das du Anfang äh, des Jahres im Kontext einer Ausstellung im äh, Haus der Kultur in der Welt gegeben hast, äh, äußerst du ja auch unter anderem halt irgendwie, wie wichtig es ist, äh, dieses... Äh, dieses Wissen nicht zu vergessen, ähm, Wissen, was äh, teilweise eventuell noch kollektives Wissen ist, äh, es zumindest halt irgendwie war und äh, verweist da ja auch unter anderem halt äh, auf die Kämpfe der Frauen, Lesben und Schwulenbewegung halt irgendwie, halt irgendwie vor allen Dingen halt irgendwie Ende der 60er und in den 70ern und, ähm, und betonst auch nochmal, wie wichtig es ist, dass äh, Aspekte nicht verloren gehen, die wir bereits äh, erreicht und äh, erkämpft haben. So, mhm. Was, also ein bisschen hast du gerade halt irgendwie schon erzählt, äh, was, was, was sich da umtreibt, aber mhm. vielleicht magst ja. du da noch mal ein bisschen mehr drauf eingehen. Also ich kann eine Seite aus dem Künstlerbuch hier vielleicht noch kurz zeigen, weil das ist so eine Stadt von München ähm, aus den frühen 80er Jahren und alle Sachen, die, marki die ähm, grau markiert sind, das sind Bars oder Sauna-Clubs, also zum Beispiel, es gibt keine lesbische Kneipe mehr in, äh, in München ähm, und das waren natürlich dann auch Gespräche, die dadurch dann stattgefunden haben, dass zum Beispiel mich die Mitglieder dann, dass wir durch die Stadt spazieren gegangen sind, teilweise als öffentliche Veranstaltungen dann auch, aber teilweise dann auch privat und einfach die ihre persönlichen Geschichten erzählt haben, also es gibt da natürlich auch ein total großes Potenzial dafür, dass wenn man da von einer anderen Generation kommt, dass es da auf einmal dann noch, noch mal so ein Bewusstsein gibt, dass es sehr wichtig ist, die Sachen zu thematisieren. Also zum Beispiel der Erdich Haas, unser ältestes Mitglied, der leider letztes Jahr verstorben ist, der auch seine Biografie im Forum veröffentlicht hat, der hat ähm, in seiner Biografie nur in einer Seite über den Paragraph 175 gesprochen. Und ich habe ihn dann öfters getroffen und habe ihn dann gefragt, ähm, ja, warum sprichst du eigentlich nur so kurz in deiner Biografie darüber, weil es würde mich ja schon total interessieren. Ja, er möchte nicht das Stigmata wiederholen, aber in Deutschland gibt es natürlich die Narration, dass so alles okay war, äh, alles auf, von, von einem Tag auf den anderen 1945 okay war, aber der Paragraph 175 hat natürlich 1969 wurde er weiter angewendet und stand bis 1994 in Westdeutschland sogar im Gesetzbuch und hat weiterhin ähm, queeres Leben kriminalisiert. Also der Paragraph hier vor allem ähm, gleichbesprechlich Beziehungen zwischen Männern. Und durch das Gespräch auf einmal hatte er auf einmal, das, dass ich das gar nicht in dem Ausmaß gewusst habe, ähm, einfach auch so eine Interesse daran entwickelt, so selber von sich dann nochmal darauf zu 
darüber zu sprechen. Und wir haben dann ähm, ein Videoporträt, das ist auch auf der Webseite des Forums ähm, und auf Vimeo und YouTube, glaube ich, sogar auch ähm, gedreht, wo er einfach über seine ähm, Geschichten erzählt und aber halt auch explizit nochmal über den Paragraph 175 gesprochen hat. Und ja. Also so, so ist die Geschichte, also so ist eigentlich meine Recherche, die hat vielleicht so in den 80er Jahren versuche ich auch so zurückzugehen oder auch mehr in die Gegenwart. Also natürlich haben nicht alle meine künstlichen Arbeiten auch vielleicht im ersten Moment was mit dem, meiner Recherche dort im Archiv zu tun und nicht alles, was ich dort mache, ist jetzt per se eine künstliche Arbeit, weil ich auch den, den Instagram-Account des Forums betreue und dadurch versuche auch eine neue, ein jüngeres Publikum auch genau, die sich vielleicht nicht mehr in der klassischen LGBT-IQ-Szene die es vielleicht in der Weise nicht mehr so gibt oder die auf jeden Fall mal heute anders stattfindet, die eben genauso auch online versucht zu erreichen und dadurch auch nochmal, also ich glaube, das, was das Forum auch da durch meine Arbeit ist, auch nochmal so ein anderes Publikum, damit nicht so ein Speeching to the Converted passiert, wo dann nur die Leute, die vielleicht selber auch Zeitzeugen waren, dann bei den Zeitzeugengesprächen sind, sondern dass es wirklich auch nochmal ja, eine, eine andere Generation auch oder verschiedene Generationen und verschiedene sexuelle Orientierungen oder auch verschiedene soziale Herkünfte ähm, da angesprochen werden. Und äh, gleichzeitig stellst du ja als äh, Künstler äh, äh, eben halt irgendwie, halt irgendwie auch in äh, internationalen halt irgendwie, halt irgendwie aus in verschiedenen Städten, aktuell in Berlin und äh, vor wenigen Monaten auch in der Nähe von Bremen, nämlich in der Ausstellung Quilty äh, im Sika Vorwerk. Und ich würde nochmal ganz gerne halt irgendwie auf deine Arbeit dort halt irgendwie zu sprechen kommen, äh, äh, die Quilts. Und auch hier nutzt du halt äh, Text und Bilder und Zitate äh, aus einem queeren kollektiven Gedächtnis, äh, einem queeren kulturellen Kanon, popkulturellen Kanon teilweise. Ähm, und wir haben, können kurz ein paar Bilder zeigen. Ich sage mir nur, welches Bild du zeigst, damit ich vielleicht weiß. Oder sehe ich das dann auch automatisch? <lacht> ich bin jetzt gerade. So, ah ja, okay, ich sehe es auch, super. Genau, jetzt, ähm, jetzt sehen wir die Quilts. Genau bei dem, dem vordersten Quilt, gerade auf dem Foto, das du jetzt zeigst, also nee, das Foto danach, äh, das ist der Quilt über Ferdinand Kriewe zum Beispiel. Also oft, Ferdinand Kriewe ist eben letztes Jahr gestorben und ich habe ihn eben zweimal besucht in Bremen, weil mich seine künstlichen Arbeiten, also es sind konkrete Poesiearbeiten, wo er dann... Ähm, Versucht, also wo dann aber die Texte, wenn man sich die Mühe macht zu lesen, sehr oft einen homoerotischen oder einen ja, über gleichgeschlechtlichen Sex oder solche Sachen sprechen, was aber so in der Kunstgeschichte zum Beispiel fast nie thematisiert wird. Und das interessieren mich eigentlich auch genauso immer die Geschichten, die vielleicht jetzt nicht so, ja, die Geschichten, die so verschollen sind oder die, wo ich auch nochmal eine ganz eine andere Perspektive machen soll. Und diese Serie von Quilts, wo ihr hier auf dem Foto ein paar seht, das ist eigentlich wie so eine Art Index für mich geworden. Also die ersten Quilts habe ich gemacht ähm, an Leute, aus, die mit dem in Verbind äh, verbunden waren mit dem Archiv in München und die an ähm, äh, Aids oder an Komplikationen mit Aids gestorben sind. Aber dann habe ich eben so viele andere Sachen gefunden. Ähm, zum Beispiel die Geschichte von Paul Höcker. Das ist der Quilt, den ihr jetzt seht. Der Paul Höcker war an der Kunstakademie in München Professor und ist wegen einem Madonna-Gemäldes, das ihr auf dem Quilt seht, ähm, ähm, gefeuert worden, 1907, also vor 113 Jahren, weil er für, das, für die Madonna einen männlichen Stricherjungen als Modell sitzen hat lassen, zu dem er ein, äh, ein sexuelles Ver Verhältnis gehabt hat. Und in Bayern wurde auch gerade der Paragraph 175 oder kurz davor ja auch angewendet schon. Und deswegen wurde er dann 
von der Akademie geschmissen. Das war aber eigentlich der erste moderne Maler an der Akademie. Ähm, und es gibt, es gibt ein paar Gemälde in Sammlungen in München, die aber nie wieder gezeigt worden sind, seit ich dann war. Und das sind halt so genau diese Geschichten, die mich eben auch so, ja, die, Vers die, ähm, ja, die, die Versuche irgendwie so herauszufinden, wo dann wo ich dann auch lange persönliche Recherchen auch manchmal, die auch sehr persönlich sind, versucht, ja. Ähm, genau, und da geht es viel um äh, Erinnerungen, äh, um äh, Erinnerungen an bestimmte halt irgendwie äh, Menschen, äh, Erinnerungen an Geschichten und ich würde im Moment tatsächlich halt irgendwie gerne noch so sehr viel mehr fragen und vor allen Dingen halt irgendwie, halt irgendwie auch, wie wir eventuell über ein Erinnern hinausgehen können, wie wir ähm, eben genau diese Geschichte, diese Geschichten ähm, auch fortschreiben können und äh, was unter anderem halt irgendwie, halt irgendwie auch Fragen sind, äh, in denen wir uns äh, letztes Jahr im Workshop schon angefangen, äh, damit äh, uns damit zu beschäftigen und dieses Jahr unter Garantie halt irgendwie, halt irgendwie auch nochmal weiter diskutieren werden und auch äh, über äh, mögliche Formen. Und ich würde sagen, wir diskutieren gerne halt irgendwie gleich weiter, auch darüber, wie verschiedene Erzählformate, äh, die Karten, mit denen Jack halt irgendwie, halt irgendwie arbeitet, äh, deine künstlerische Arbeit, wie, es gibt so ein wunderbares äh, Zitat äh, in dem Ausstellungskatalog, I wanna give you devotion, was ich jetzt natürlich dummerweise nicht zur Hand habe, was aber eben genau in die Zukunft weist, äh, wo es halt irgendwie um äh, das Begehren geht. <lacht> <lacht> genau. <lacht> Und vielleicht kommen wir da gleich nochmal im gemeinsamen Gespräch halt irgendwie drauf zurück. Würde mich zumindest sehr freuen. Und ich gebe zurück an Eva. Hallo, ja, ich habe mich gehört. Jetzt? Jetzt hört man mich? Okay. Ah, gut. So, Entschuldigung, es gab hier einen technischen Strom meinerseits. Aber jetzt bin ich wieder dabei. Ähm, vielen Dank für beide Gespräche. Um, so, I switch to English now, as promised. So thanks a lot for uh, the great talks, actually, to all four of you, to Jack, Philip, and Thomas and Nina. I really enjoyed them. So, and I must say, I already saw a lot of things you had in common. It's interesting that before I didn't see so much, honestly. So I'm quite interested in our discussion now that starts now. So um, send us your questions, please, everyone who's watching. Send us uh, your questions uh, on Twitter, on YouTube, in our pad, wherever. 
please let us know. And also um, the participants of our workshop, they will have a possibility to ask their questions in front of a camera. So we have kind of a, um, what is the English word again for that? It's not hot seat. Ah, oh, yeah, it's hot seat, actually, in German. It's called heißer Stuhl. So um, actually, it's not kind of a chair where you get grilled. It's more like you have the possibility to ask a question and be there with your picture. So, but first I start our little talk. Is everyone with us right now? So, Philip, you are there. I see you. But what about Jack? Could Jack join us? Okay. Jack will be there in any minute, I guess. So, um, I don't know. I could just start with one question. Jack is in. I got a message right here. Please wait for me. Okay, ah, a question. Okay, I already have two questions. That's good. So, okay, I just start with you, Philip. Sorry that you're alone. <laughs> but I already start in English, if that's okay. Ah, there is Jack. Hello. Hello, sir. <laughs> Finally, also hello from me. Hello. Very happy to have you guys. And um, yeah, I start right away. Actually, we thought together of a question that we might ask. And what came up to our mind was immediately like, what about Corona right now? I mean, you both study the history, let's say, or a history of queer traces, but what about the present? So because now of the pandemic, bars, even if you don't like to talk about them, they are closed. So, and also clubs and a lot of places that are also important, for example, for queer, let's say, subculture also in Bremen, they are not available. So, how does that change in general, queer traces? When your opinion. I also, <laughs> I'll, I'll start, how about I start and we'll, I'll be brief and then um, okay. I, wa I watch, uh, I go to a lot of, uh, queer fundraisers online and queer dancing online and my Instagram has changed dramatically. I'm in the discussion. Where do I, how do I do that? Everything is fine. You're Can in I the hear? discussion. I, I hear you and everyone else does. Oh, goody. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think there were, there's other people in my ears who are helping me translate. They, I want to thank uh, Ah. Yes, I guess. So um, they, uh, um, I think people have to be online if they can be online. And so now it's like different ways of making space and connection and data. I'm pretty obsessed with the Lex app, L-E-X, um, which is uh, like a personal based lesbian, queer, intersex, gender non-conforming and space. And it's all uh, text personals there's no images and um you know people are looking for friends or you know or or sex or someone just to talk about buffy the vampire slayer with you know whatever it suits their boat that night and so they're finding other ways to make connection um but it's super hard to track i know the lgbt center archives in new york city has a has a queer and tie archive that you could submit your notes and your books and your journals um but yeah, it's 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 absolutely it's not this physical space. It's going to be it's like a whole other way of imagining where we are. What do you think? Like uh, <laughs> it's I'm also of course still processing, but uh, yeah, I think like what I experience is that at least here in Amsterdam, cruising, which was like a metaphor in um, in the art world for the last year, suddenly became actually much more used as well. Uh, and especially gay cruising, of course, like in specific, like here there are places like next to a lake and stuff like that. And I found this also quite interesting because like there are of course like all these apps, but it also leads to a certain frustration, of course, after a while, or like to a 
certain form of distancing and then outside it's of course like much safer than in a bar so i'm i'm kind of happy that these cruising spots are being also rediscovered by a younger generation i have to say <laughs> I see we also have questions now from our audience. I would start right with one. That's okay for you guys. So we have one actually from our team. Um, I just read it. Okay. Thanks. It sounds like a really interesting and inspiring project or like really in interesting and inspiring projects. I'm wondering about the interviews you conducted. It's a question for Jack. Sorry, didn't tell that before. Um, how did you find the people you interviewed? How were they? Uh, who were they? Excuse me. What kind of questions did you ask? Were these long conversations? So in general, I think this person wants to know more about the interviews you conducted. Oh my God, I love methods. Thanks for the question. Um, I. Interview. I posted flyers and I walked in the Dyke March and I walked in Pride and I went to like every restaurant and I posted thousands of flyers. I just put them everywhere. Um, and I think because I was lesbian and queer, I primarily got white people um, uh, uh, and um, some black and Latinx participants, but I had no Asian, South Asian, Southeast Asian, East Asian participants. I had no indigenous identified participants. And um, Uh, we met in multi-generational focus groups. So the 80s and the 90s and the 00s would together and then they talk separately and be like, is that how it worked? Like, whoa, or that's so cool, we do the same thing. Um, and everyone made a mental map of spaces and places important to them when they came uh, to the interview. And they also brought an artifact that was important to them when they were coming out. So the 80s brought a lot of those. Do you remember when we had a lot of buttons in the 80s, like dip me in chocolate and throw me to the lesbians was really popular. So a couple people had that button. And so they, it was like a way to start talking. So they would just start talking about their stories. And um, uh, yeah, so 47 people agreed to talk to me for about six hours total in three different meetings. So it was a lot of meetings and then I paid them all, all the money I got for fellowships I gave them and to thank them for their time. Yeah. So they found listservs or flyers. It was kind of random. And how long did the interviews? Oh, um, the interviews were uh, three hours, uh, like for a group of people talking, um, usually two to three hours each one. Uh, yeah, and I videoed them and then transcribed them with their reactions, like when they waved their hands or they were like, oh, you know, like kind of shock, I put that, or they laughed, I put that in there. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's 14 pages of transcripts, 14, yeah, so yeah, it's a, it's a lot of data. Like for it's yeah, it's a couple books just to read it. So all the transcripts are going to be donated to the Lesbian History Archives eventually. I have another yes, I have another question too for you guys. Um, it's from Kian. I hope I say the name the name right. So uh, Kian, um, as a queer, I'd like to know if there are any different differences visible between, sorry, <laughs> between spaces for queer white people and queer BPOC, and also if there are even spaces denied BPOC. Shall I read it again, or was it clear? I'll start. I think in Munich, it's of course like also um, a very special, or like it's a very It's not a very international city to say at least, and I think like one one part was of course like that a lot of um, soldiers were there from America in in the south of Germany after the Second World War, which um, changed a, a little bit the change. But I think like what happened now the last five years during the refugee crisis, of course, like changed a lot, like the. Yeah, the visibility of people of color also like in the materials of the archive and also like their self-organized groups of refugees or people of color groups in, in Munich now as well. And we are depending with our collection because like our budget is so small, so much on donations, like the people are really like willing to give us something. 
So of course that we try to contact them and inform about our archives, but it's also like of these groups, like, like they also have to be ready to talk to us and give us materials. But this luckily changed a lot because I think like there were for sure, especially specifically in the German context till the eighties and nineties, still a lot, like a really little visibility of not only people of color, but also, for example, of transsexual uh, materials, also from materials of East Germany, uh, for example. So there are like a lot of blind spots, of course, in the archive. And I think that's the most interesting part to think all the time, like what is missing and how, how can we include them? And how can we invite them? And I think this didn't happen so much have in our small group of volunteers organizing it, it's happening actually a lot. And I think this was totally different, for example, of um, when there was a um, lot of um, groups from uh, guest workers from uh, Turkey and Italy came in the, in the 60s and 70s to Germany. They were completely excluded, more or less, from, from the society and also had really little visibility in the LGBTIQ scene. And I think that there's really like awareness rising of about like, yeah, yeah, sharing this visibility. So, yeah, I hope this was not too long to answer. <laughs> no, was perfect, actually. And uh, yeah, for you, Jack, I mean, you live in the USA, so there, it's probably different considering <laughs> visibility. Yeah, Black Lives Matter is, is uh, everywhere. But one thing I think for the German context is there's a new book out by Tiffany Florville, Mobilizing Black Germany, about the history of Afro-German movement. Um, and the word Afro-German was coined by Audre Lorde when she came over for her cancer treatments. Um, and so I think there's this beautiful way we're kind of bound together um, in that too. Uh, but I, I think that, um, you know, when I lived in Germany and definitely living in New York, um, and in this research, um, spaces are segregated. There were always, in, it were, in many places, there were always limits to how many people of color were allowed into bars, especially black people. The idea that the bar would be flipped and wouldn't be white. Marlon Riggs talks about that in 1989 um, in Tongues Untied or 88. Um, and I think uh, this has been ongoing for a long time. And there were protests, uh, you know, each decade there would be another protest at another bar. Um, about racist practices, and they always show up in my stories. And I think that there are a lot of places where uh, LGBTQ people of all races hung out, um, but uh, music matters and identity matters and representation matters and um, how people are seen. There was a bar called Caddyshack that downstairs it was black and brown and upstairs was all white um, and played two different kinds of music and didn't really talk to one another. That at, at times, sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. Um, and I think the, um, like in bi POC stories, there are other ways and more reliance on um, restaurants. Um, there's a lot more reliance on apartments and apartment parties, um, even more so uh, than white people, um, public spaces um, and dealing with policing in them always. Um, so there's a lot more to navigate. They usually have to live farther from the city center, so they pay more to get in. They spend more time doing that. They face so much stresses and inequalities and injustices. So they do a lot more work um, to be part of that. Uh, okay. We have another question. Um, it's from Durban, from the Feminist Film Archive, uh, Bildwechsel in Hamburg. Uh, Durban asks, what happened to the videos? Did they also go to the lesbian archive? Oh, no, they, I destroyed them. Sorry, I destroyed them. They were supposed to be destroyed, I promised. Yeah, yeah, so they don't exist. Um, but I can see them in my memory. I watched them way too many times. But yeah, they, they're destroyed. <laughs> That's oh, so um, unfortunate. But, yeah. <laughs> No, I know. I didn't think that anyone would want to watch those. But um, there, uh, but all the maps will go there. All the mental maps will go there eventually, too. So. Okay, and another question. Um, we have a question for Philip. 
Philip, you mentioned digital formats. How could they work for artistic way, for an artistic way of working with an art with archive findings? Mm. I, I think, Sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think like um, it's a good question, and we still, of course, like also trying to find new formats. And I think these formats have to be found more now than ever before, of course, because we are so much, um, yeah, I'm limited on this right now. But I think it's also like, in, in, of course, like introducing like archival materials on our Instagram page, for example. But um, yeah, I think like there can be uh, for sure much more happen I, I have to say I'm also partly skeptical about it. Like I, I just made a new video about like and I tried to retell her story and how, how her transgender identity was being totally neglected um, by the media. And the video work is finished now and I'm not allowed to, or like I'm not able to show it because all exhibitions are of course postponed. And but I'm, I'm also refusing to put it on Vimeo because this is such a sensitive story that I really feel like there is this collective sharing also really necessary. So I think like in a certain way, I think not everything can happen or like at least from my perspective as an artist and my experiences, this collective sharing and this collective watching a film together and having a discussion afterwards is so important part of my practice as an understanding for me as an artist that I cannot like to put it now just on Vimeo it's it's not a possibility I have to wait till I finally can show the work <laughs> and yeah it's also um, a difficult process of course for all of us but yeah I think um, yeah for me it's important to have like these social interactions Okay. Um, yeah, actually, the publishing aspect is pretty interesting, I think, because like, yeah, these are, as you said, Jack, they're also very sensitive stories. So you ask people about their everyday life back then. So that means this isn't probably supposed to be public in every case. So how, how do you want to reach all the queers outside, let's say, that want to maybe know more about their history. Yeah, well, I like thinking about privacy, half of my participants said that they wanted me to use their real names when I published the book, but that was during Obama. And then when I finished the book, I was like, you're going to say things that people might come after you for. Like, I'm going to, I changed their names. So you didn't guess this was a real person's name or not. And I had to get rid of all the ex-girlfriend's names. And, you know, the exact locations of some people, because you knew it was that person. There was only one black person living there, one white person living there. Um, but I, I think it's something I, I think about a lot. Like, how do you make it every day, but you anonymize it so much and you don't destroy that kind of reality and that live reality. There's a lot of work. Sorry, I was thinking about that. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, totally. That's very interesting. So... And oh yes, uh, because now we're still waiting for questions. I know. <laughs> Are there any? Not I would. I have some. I have a lot. I must say, since I hear, you, I heard you guys talk. So, um, for example, what I wonder about this aspect, like you asking very private questions about the private life, about the everyday life. So, actually. History is also about choosing what's important, right? To remember. So, how do you decide that? Do you have some kind of catalog where you say, like, this is important, this is not important? So, how do you do that? A question to both of you, actually, at this point. It's kind of random what you get told, right? Because I talked to these people for, you know, it's 1400 pages of stories, but maybe they left out the story that would have explained so much more, or they didn't, you know, they wanted to hide how racist they were, or they didn't hide how racist they were, and they didn't realize it. And 10 years later, they do, they got woke, um, or they're woke and waking. Um, 
I like I it's really hard to ask them and my participants some of them were really annoyed they're like what does that mean what is my everyday life they're like do you know where I buy my deodorant and I was like does it sure like tell me about where you go and what your life is like so it's how they interpreted the question and so by having the maps that they drew the mental maps they would say oh I I didn't include that place but that's I would count the park slope food co-op I would do that or and I would count this pizza place that everyone got drunk at the bar and then hung out in. Um, uh, but no one had drew that on the map. Like 25 years, people went to the same pizza place after going to the bars in the West Village and no one put it on the map. So there's kinds of places that become queer that we don't uh, think about in the same way. So trying to like listen for those words. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's also like, I like like the archive in munich like the forum we have like a question list or something like some guidelines how to make uh, and history, history um talks with um people from bars or like also really different or activists or like people from really different backgrounds and i think it's of, of course like this is, of course, the great thing about a self-organized archive. It's not only like celebrities or like, as in Czech's work as well, where it's really like or very important political person. It's also like about a daily life of, of the activists. And these question lists, of course, ex we develop them together to have mm -hmm. like some guidelines what to ask. But most of the times from my experience, it's also just like be with this person and just like, give them the space and to tell their stories and not only to follow these guidelines from my perspective when I made like some interviews now as part of my work there. Okay. Um, I heard you typing, Jack. Well, I was taking notes for later, I had an idea. Ah, um, okay. Can I ask Philip a question? Can, well, can I ask Philip? How did, did you feel like, like in the conversations about AIDS, that, that it is multi-generational? Do you feel that, um, and it, and I'm assuming there's a lot more about men, cisgender men, um, that there is something that's more cross-generational to them and their conversations about AIDS? or that they kind of remained in their kind of age groups? Um, like, how, how did that work? Like, how does cross-generational knowledge work? Like, what did you see? I think there was, of course, like a skepticism towards mm -hmm. my approach. I, I felt definitely in the beginning, not only like doing this from a different generation, but also like from my artistic background. And then there were, were in the beginning, very much confusion why I'm interested even in it. But I think, um, yeah, I, I grew up honestly, like always like with this fear about AIDS, but I never could really grasp it where it's really coming from. I'm born 1989, so I'm born exactly like on the, on the highest point of the, uh, of the fear. And it's, something I really reflected through the process um, of like making the work, how much internalized I have like this still in me, even of course the medical situation changed completely. Um, I still had like this very big parent, not yeah, paranoia about AIDS or like this same assumption and only like by really like talking to these people um, who were some of them like have long time so, um, survivors getting the, um, getting the virus or like being tested positive in the 80s and still, for example, like had to use RCT for some part of their life. It's of course very different uh, um, stories um, like from um, we have now from the medication, but I think like the stigma, the social stigma is more or less the same yeah. and it didn't actualize so much actually and i think that's so much which where there's so much work still necessary yeah. so how, 
Oh yeah. No, no. I just I I have a friend Marika C4 who's a um a, 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 a info studies scholar, and she went and researched all like all the exhibitions about AIDS, um and ACT UP and how it was portrayed and how it created a history of AIDS because she was so born around the same moment was like what is why do I feel attacked? Like how much of this is my history and how do I make sense of it? And like, how do people narrate the past? Um, so I think about that a lot too. Like in, like definitely, I think that like people who came out in the eighties, you can see there are different moments over time where people, like if you came out in the eighties, like that doesn't go away. You keep hating yourself. Like mm-hmm. as much as you fight against it and there's liberation, there's like, that's that's a huge just like it's a huge force like ronald reagan was a gross huge force and like you know and and so you know and so was everything happening uh all over, you know all over the world so i think it like hangs on and what happened like coming out before matt shepherd dies versus after um you know coming out like there's so many major uh people who who die or you know like um you know marriage when marriage comes through or uh, transgender surgery is covered in, in Germany. Like it's a totally different mentality. Um, when I lived in Berlin, I was I remember talking to people about how upset um, trans people were in 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 not just trans people, but the queer community kind of fell apart when trans people started getting hormones because we don't have nationalized health care. So different cities, people could get free hormones at different times. And I asked, what was that like here? And they're like, well, there's a state. And then we all got hormones at the same time, right? Like, and we waited years and we saw you fall apart. Like somebody told me, um, like we saw you fall apart and we wanted to do it differently. Uh, And I think we're also learning from one another and watching and like, but that that stigma and the hurt um, carries too. And we always have to fight back against that and not let people tell us we're less than. Yeah, talking about, uh, let's say, hard sides of the research, too. So um, a question from one uh, participant, I think, um, for it, Jack. While you were doing your research, were there any situations where you attacked as a trans dyke queer person, for example, by gay men? Oh, no, I didn't seem to hang out with very... I have some... Gay, I, have, I have lots of, I have a lot of gay male friends but no they they were quite um no and I when I was doing the research I was out as trans to myself and I wasn't like capable of talking about it very much I didn't know what to say I you know I hadn't changed my name yet um nobody people who identified as trans in my research told me that one-on-one and then didn't talk about it in a group like there was a lot of transphobia you know people were and people were saying things like wow what we did in the 80s to trans women when we excluded them from bars was wrong there wasn't there weren't there wasn't room at the table for those voices and i did i absolutely didn't know how to talk about it yet i do think that there were people who had a lot of assumptions about how space worked um more so more than the transphobia about whiteness um that queer spaces are this way and not thinking about how that works for white people um, and the privilege and power they have to like claim spaces um, and afford spaces. Um, and I think that was like more of a prevalent um, theme, like assumption that needed to be. Yeah. And we have another question too from um, Laura is her name. She's from the University of Fechter. And she's writing, hello, my name is Laura from the University of Fechter, and I would be interested in how the representation of queer space spaces has changed with generation aging. I would assume that there might be that, that there might has been a shift from private to more publicity spaces. And there's a question to you both. Uh, what will be your next projects as Corona will last for at least some months? How will you proceed working? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. So this is the coolest thing because when I went to Germany, I didn't know you went to the same bar your whole life. I thought that was the coolest thing because we age out of bars, but you guys like have stomptish. And I was like, this is amazing. Like I, um, I was like young American, like this is magical. What a community. And I think there's like a different way of creating space over time. And like, Oh, what was that? Uh, uh, rad untat 
in Berlin, like this women's space that the state pays for women's spaces. Look at my American shock. That's fucking amazing. That's beautiful. My God. And I was sitting there crying in the back of Rotten Tat with these old books and no one had touched them. They were covered in dust, but they existed and nobody was going to move them. That was going to stay there. That was the best. Like the kind of way that place stays, even with gentrification, is so different. And it changed all of my ideas about like this idea of the American dream. Like living in Germany made it possible to write this book and see how American it was. Like how absurd we were. Like I and and um, we do some things well, but we do things really bad too. And it, but like whoa, like that's like the aging in bars. Like lesbians and queers age out of bars at thirty five. Gay men sometimes they'll keep going. So I think that's a big thing. I think like it's also, I think that there's also some, sometimes I'm skeptical about this notion to make like everything, I think like also Czech told already like about like to keep still the privacy changing the names. And like, I think it's only like, there is like also like a, a, a certain like, um, pressure of like everything has to come out and like has to be historicized. I think like the p possibility of things disappearing is also something very beautiful to me and mm. and like the myths around it and like that we don't know and like the yeah, how to describe this. I'm also like I don't and I think that's also what I'm trying to like with my quilts. I don't know if you saw a bit on the photos like the the people are not only portrayed and it's like an iconic photo of them. I printed very big in like an Andy Warhol style uh, matter. I think I really want to comp complicate also like the narr narrations. It's, it cannot be only like iconographic kind of like um, helden helden geschichten or um, hero stories or something. Mm -hmm. I think it's. I think we also have to take care to um, yeah to have. To, to put like these people, if they're not alive anymore and we're talking about them, to not only put them on like a pedestal or a pet, pet, sorry, my, I'm losing my English, but to, to show them as a humans with also like mistakes and like and different yeah, complexities or something. And I think that's what I at least like try to do like with these works on fabrics where sometimes like we don't see a photo, uh, a photo of a very important photo, but it's on the second fabric layer, and you don't see it first. So you have to lift the fabric or something, mm -hmm. or like the fabric is transparent, and you have mm -hmm. to move around to really see it. I think like that's kind of like ways I want to visualize, also like this need for more complex and more yeah different stories, how to how to tell people's life and how to talk with each other. And it's so cool because when they touch it, then there's the oils on their fingers that they're leaving and they're like making this residue, like they're part of it. That's so beautiful. The curator's end of, of course, or the museums when I tell the people it's allowed to be <laughs> yeah. almost like kicked out of my own, uh, of the exhibition where I was, uh, but the, uh, the people who guarded the show didn't know that I'm the artist and he was like, no, you have to leave, no, you're the artist, everyone can say it. But like, <laughs> When I have influence on it, I'm always like other people. If you have clean hands, you can touch them. Right? Mm. I think it's also like this textual relationship. It's also so much about like finding the the right fabric, mm. which is much more portraying the person sometimes than like an image of them or something. Oh. Wow. That's beautiful. <laughs> So uh, I just uh, read, because I'm all the time also in the chat, I read there are other questions too. So, um, but no, but uh, there's still a message from Durban, uh, from Hamburg, especially for you, Jack. Uh, it says, Jack, if you ever can come to Hamburg, visit Bildwechsel, the feminist film archive we have had our 14th last year. So, cool. This film archive is inviting you. <laughs> I'm, I, I'd be there if I, when I can leave the, when you would want an American to come to your beautiful country again. I bells on. 
um, when we're allowed to leave, when we learn how to quarantine properly and we mm. cut down on COVID, then, then I'll be there. Yes, I would be honored. Um, and I'm, I'm so sad that I didn't know when I did the research that I, that like I treated it as a research format instead of like, and I've met so many people who do video that would have loved to see those. And I didn't imagine that at the time. So, yeah. So, and I have one final question for you because uh, as you know, this is an event for a, a workshop that is now starting actually. So tomorrow uh, the participants will meet for the first time and they will try to, yeah, map queer history. So as experienced historians, that is your, <laughs> your expert for that. So um, <laughs> can you give maybe some advice to our participants? How should they start? Which questions can they ask? Like, what is interesting? Um, hmm. Or let's say something that uh, recently you noticed where you said like, ah, oh, this is actually a thing you should keep in mind if you look at your city, at your, I, yeah. I think if people want to like start, like some people would want to make a list. Some people might want to draw a map. Some people might want to like, what is a queer space um, or what happens, like things experienced in a queer space. And maybe like whatever somebody calls to to just get that down on paper, like your own words and your own ideas. And then I guess my biggest piece of advice is it's okay because we've been so separated and like, we think we're experiencing the same things, but there's a lot we don't know that's happening to one another. Um, and that what is a queer space to someone is not a queer space to someone else. And to just make space for that conversation. And I think that that's really, really important. What about you, Philip? What do you say? Yeah, I think like one thing is also really like to to take away the pressure of like of a result or something. I in the beginning I was like, or uh, me as like not an historian, as an artist who never had like, um, yeah, I never learned how to have like an oral history interview. It was like really like to, for me, the most important thing was really like to lose your expectations or something. And to, of course, like you contact or the person contacted you with a certain interest and shared interests anyway. But then, um, yeah, that sometimes like when I'm beginning a new project and I go into some that your own expectations can also limit you very much. And I think that's something you always have to be very much aware about and really like put yourself down for a moment and also like perhaps just like have an interest for this first moment and you don't know how it looks in the end. I think that's also completely fine to keep the openness, keep yourself open as much as possible to find them the right format will find itself in the end. And perhaps it's, just for yourself, the interview. <laughs> totally. And for the person, of course, as well. And you have to find together out what to do. <laughs> Actually, we also have another question um, from Moritz. He asked, um, how, what would you recommend communities on how to start they, their mapping project? Okay, so this is about communities. Is it somehow different, would you say, or, yeah? I don't From... want to hear what you mean. <laughs> Excuse me? I, I, I think that, um, so there's this great paper by these uh, two white cisgender lovely gay men named Larry Brown and Michael Knopp, and they got the most diverse group of queer people, people in Seattle, from like 80 years old to really young in the same room. And then they wrote a paper about how they couldn't get everyone to agree to, about what to make on a map. And it was a physical map. So there's also something to think about in the interactive map um, of putting dots on something you can all click on and read the stories or something like queeringthemap.com. Amazing website that anyone can just click on a point and add a very personal story. And you have no idea when it happened or who it happened to. Um, 
And I think like mapping in communities, like it goes right back to the community. It's like, okay, well, what do you want to, what do you want to know? What's important for us to record and what do you want to know? And what do you feel is missing in your life? And how can we put that together? I guess like, and it's specific to communities too. Like I called the book a queer New York because like it, it, there's countries of New York city and we always keep freaking talking about it. I'm sorry. I'm still talking about it. And, and like, we need queer issues of everywhere, you know, like that's really mind blowing that, that shifts things. Okay. So Philip, if you don't want to add something to that. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't have, I think it's for me also very much the box. I would just like to have like, because like also, the, yeah. I think then you also really understand like how you perceive like the, the stories differently and like what happened somewhere there for one person can also be totally different for someone else. So I would just like perhaps like not only like sit somewhere, I think also like the way of walking or yeah, I think also for me at least like it was always something which changed. Yeah, and we haven't talked like about the architecture changed a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, architecture, I hadn't even thought about the art. My gosh, obviously, and also disability, right? Like, what does it mean to be rolling down the street and have this experienced? Or you know, uh, it, there's like how, um, or there's a, so many different kinds of disability or differently able bodies like shaping space and also like the physical environment, what it affords, like the architecture, right? And the design and the aesthetic um, really come back together. Too. Okay. Um, yeah, since we've already, already been talking for two hours, uh, I unfortunately must bring up two minutes. <laughs> but I'm two and a half hours. Also, the only thing against the weird situation with Corona and this kind of digital event, but it's lovely to do. And it's nice. So, the talks, I enjoyed them a lot. And so, it was very, very new and interesting for me, too. So, and I guess for others, too. And yeah, thank you. Thank Captain you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much for Thank you, Philip. Yeah. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, it was really nice too. <laughs> Philip, your work is so beautiful. Thank you. I love talking to artists. You're so much more fun than, than academics. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And yeah. yeah. Thank you. Tell me again, like, what's the title of your book? Because yeah. a queer New York yeah. of lesbian. And then of course, that's a good point. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There, oh, if you, there's a thirty percent off code if you want it. It's called. It's all caps. Queer NY at the NYU. If you go to the NYU website, you get thirty percent off, and it'll be online free soon. If you buy it, don't buy it. Read it online for free. I love a free book. You know, and someone will put it on the internet and then steal it. Please steal. It. I would rather everyone. If you want to read that, yeah, mm -hmm. just you can. Yeah, it's easy to search then. You can find all the sex parts and the U-hauling and the, yeah, it's much more. Yeah. And check whether you're in Munich or in Amsterdam, please let me know. I would love, if, or like anyone from Bremen, of course, as well. Like we organize, the forum is organizing regularly archive tours and city tours to the city of Munich and to our collection. And yeah, we would be always happy to give you one. <laughs> I went to the Homo oh, Monument. Yeah. I was sitting on it for the longest time. I feel so silly. I would love to have an actual tour and know where I'm going in Amsterdam. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I also have to say thank you again in German also to all the others. Also, danke nochmal an alle, die jetzt zugeschaut haben. Danke für eure Fragen. Danke für alle. Also, danke an alle Workshop-TeilnehmerInnen, die auch jetzt hier waren und Vielen Dank an alle, die uns gesehen haben. Vielen Dank an alle, die uns gesehen haben.
die Kamera zu drehen. Ich hoffe, die drehen sich auch mal. Oh Gott, ich muss ja sogar meinen Laptop drehen, weil die sitzen hier nämlich bei mir. So Leute, dreht euch mal um. Ich glaube, wir müssen näher ran. Näher ran. Okay. In the blue light. Again. Da haben wir Flo, Camilla und Regina. Unser Technik-Team wahnsinnig engagiert die ganze Zeit. Das hat so gut geklappt wie ich. Regina. Okay. Ja. <lacht> und äh, danke auch für die Überraschung. Damit äh, beenden wir das für heute. Ich äh, war vielleicht. Und genau. Thanks to you, Eva, as well. For moderation. Danke. <laughs> okay, dann, ja. Uh, yeah. Have a lo lovely evening, a lovely night. Here the sun, sun is still shining. I hope we we'll have a beer here. Thanks. For sure. So, yes. See you soon. Yes. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.